Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware. We have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit. But frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. The clown to the left of me is Katie. The joker to my right is Ellen. And here you are, stuck stuck in in the the middle middle with us. And while we have you here, let's roll right into the rolling rehash. Last time, we discussed Chapter 13, Nicholas Flamel, and its corresponding film scenes, the latter of which were sadly mostly cut out by the screenwriter or banished to the realm of deleted scenes. Luckily, Katie was able to get a good nap in while I read my dissertation before she got to read her whopping three sentences. We missed out on seeing more Oliver Wood in another Quidditch game, Ron ginger raging on Malfoy, and Neville trying to take on Crabbe and Goyle about five years too early. We also discussed what may have been the best deleted scene ever, involving genuinely frizzy hair, an 11-year-old with a bald spot, a trio of dicks, and an actually logical transition into the next scene where we finally find out who the hell the not-at-all-recent Nicholas Flamel is. During episode 13, Dancing Cream, our Potter pondering was about Nicholas Flamel being nearly 666. Is that number significant? Is it considered a bad thing in the wizarding world? This Potter pondering started an interesting discussion because it made Dave wonder if witches and wizards are religious. Carly pointed out that the series does mention some Christian holidays, such as Christmas and Easter, but that the man who married Bill and Fleur wasn't a clergyman, as far as we know. I think the movie sort of implied that he was a ministry official, but he also presided over Dumbledore's funeral, though, so he could have had religious affiliations, and J.K. just chose not to go more in-depth with them. That's possible. Yeah. I also pointed out that Harry's parents were buried in a church graveyard. So Mm -hmm. there is an argument that can be made that religion does hold a place in the wizarding world. Though, unless that's something that JK actually goes into detail about, we can really only speculate. Yeah. Like, the fact that there's a St. Mungo's and the church was St. Jerome's. Right. Things like that. But specifically about the number 666... Carly shared that she thinks that numbers always mean something, though Quincy doesn't really think it's significant because it's never brought up again. He pointed out that JK was really good about consistency and making plot points from previous books bleed later into the series. So if his age had a significant purpose, it would have been explored more in the book or Dumbledore or somebody would have at least mentioned it. Right. And uh, Brad pointed out that since he shows up in Crimes of Grindelwald, that there is still a chance we could hear if there is some significance. But that's also, it could have just been to show how long of a lifespan he had. Yeah, I ended up looking into this myself and realized that there could be a very obvious answer to the age. Since Flamel is a known historical figure, the age is likely based on the estimation of his actual birthday. And there's apparently some vagueness about the precise date, but it's thought to be around 1330 to 1340. Mm -hmm. So if he was alive in 1991, when Harry was in his first year at Hogwarts, he would have been around 665 years old. Well, but then you run into the issue of when was that book published that said he was 665. It looked pretty old in the movie. Yeah. Hmm. Well, maybe instead of people having to write second editions, the book just magically updates themselves for biographies and whatnot. Man, I mean, that would make sense. That's, it it kind of, it would work out that way. Same thing with like the chocolate frog cards and stuff. Right. You can't just, there's a lot of fucking books, man. It'd be fun if it magically updated. I like that idea. (laughs) Headcanon. But I also read that there was a lot less vagueness surrounding his death. Apparently, despite being thought to have been born in the 14th century, he wasn't even rumored to be an alchemist until the 17th century. Hmm. And in the Harry Potter verse, that would have just been the first time his cover was broken, because obviously he faked his death. And left everything to his wife or eerily identical brother. But ultimately, it sounds to me like his age most likely comes from an estimate of when he was born. Which makes sense to me. Yeah. Our trivia question last week was... According to Hagrid's outdated book, what should you feed a baby dragon? 
bonus points if you can also tell us how often. The answer is a bucket of brandy mixed with chicken's blood every half hour. This trivia question got pretty intense, actually. Right? I woke up around 1 a.m., and when I checked my phone for the time, I had a whole bunch of Facebook notifications. And it was a little confusing at first because my phone didn't give me official timestamps, just said that two people had answered it about an hour before I was looking at my phone. Mm-hmm. And Dave had answered it on the official post, so I declared him the winner over Quincy, who had created his own post for it again, but they both said it was an hour previously. Yeah, but I was on my computer and I could see the official to the minute timestamps. And as much as Dave wanted to beat Quincy, he did miss it by 11 minutes. 11 minutes. 11 minutes. So close. Quincy's post was uh, timestamped at 11.59 and Dave's was timestamped at 12.10. Amazing. So it was very close. Yeah, and now since... The rules are to find the post and answer on the post. I'm going to pull a Dumbledore here and hand out points however I damn well please. (laughs) So I say Dave and Quincy have tied for this trivia question since they both knew the answer and the bonus. I like how you were accusing me of being the one who's going to just give out points arbitrarily. And here you are making up your own rules. Well, I'm doing it to make it fair you're a slither and you weren't going to be fair with it <gasps> but, <Rude. laughs> but quincy was technically first but he didn't put the answer in the right place and dave did so participation trophies all around quincy still gets to keep his streak now at five weeks but we acknowledge that dave also knew that it was a bucket of brandy mixed with chicken's blood every half hour it's a lot of brandy it's a lot of brandy and a lot of chicken's blood for that matter Let's just keep rolling, though, right into chapter 14, Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback and the corresponding film scenes. Chapter 14, Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback. Quarrel seems to be braver than the trio thought. As the weeks passed, he got thinner and paler, but the third floor corridor still seems to be guarded by Fluffy. Snape is bad-tempered, so they assume the stone must still be safe. Harry and Ron are trying to be supportive and encouraging to Quirrell, but Hermione has also become obsessed with studying for the upcoming exams, since they need to pass them to get into their second year. This starts to get on Harry and Ron's nerves, because the exams are still ten weeks away. Unfortunately, the teachers have the same attitude as Hermione, and have started piling the homework on them. It even interrupts their Easter holidays, and once again, they find themselves spending a lot of time in the library. One day, they see Hagrid in the library and ask him what he's doing there. Hagrid is hiding something behind his back and suspiciously says he's just looking, then changes the subject, asking the trio if they are still looking for Nicholas Flamel. Ron tells him that they already figured that out, and that they know that Fluffy is guarding the Sorcerer's Stone. Hagrid cuts him off, worrying someone will overhear. Harry says they want to ask him some things about the stone. Hagrid agrees to meet them in his hut later before he leaves. Ron goes to investigate what book section he was looking at and discovers that Hagrid was looking into dragons. Harry tells them that Hagrid has always wanted a dragon and Ron mentions that it is against wizard laws. Harry's surprised to learn that there are wild dragons in Britain and Hermione wonders what Hagrid is up to. Later, when the three show up at Hagrid's hut, they notice that everything is closed up and it is way too hot with a blazing fire going, despite being a warm day. He offers them tea and stoat sandwiches, which they refuse and launch right into asking him about what is guarding the stone apart from Fluffy. Hagrid says he can't tell them because he doesn't know and even if he did, he wouldn't. Hermione butters him up by telling him that even if he can't tell them, she knows that he knows because he knows everything that goes on around Hogwarts. She explains that they mostly wonder who was doing the guarding, who Dumbledore trusted enough aside from him. This did the trick and Hagrid decides he can tell them who was involved in protecting the stone. Professor Sprout, Professor Flitwick, Professor McGonagall, Professor Quirrell, Professor Dumbledore himself, and Professor Snape. They are very surprised to find out that Snape is helping to protect the stone. Hagrid tries to use this as evidence that Snape isn't about to steal it, but the trio all figure that being in on the protection would only make it easier for Snape to figure out what else is guarding it. 
Hermione confirms that Hagrid is the only one who knows how to get past Fluffy, and Hagrid says that Dumbledore knows too. Harry is getting really hot and asks Hagrid if they can open a window, but Hagrid says they can't and glances towards the fire. Harry follows his gaze and sees a dragon's egg in the heart of the fire. Hermione wants to know where Hagrid got it, and he tells him that he won it in a game of cards. He references the book he got out of the library and shares that the egg is a Norwegian Ridgeback. He has to keep it in the fire until it hatches and then feed it a bucket of brandy mixed with chicken's blood every half hour. Hagrid is very excited, but Hermione points out that he lives in a wooden house. The trio now have to add Hagrid's dragon to their list of things to worry about, along with exams, homework, and Snape. One day, during breakfast, Hedwig arrives with a note from Hagrid that simply says, It's hatching. Ron and Harry want to skip class to go immediately, but Hermione refuses to miss Herbology. Ron and Hermione argue about it a little, and Harry notices that Malfoy is trying to listen in and warns them to be quiet. They all decide to go to Hagrid's during their morning break. They make it to Hagrid's just in time to see the dragon come out of the egg. Harry finds it kind of ugly, but Hagrid is completely enamored. As they are looking at and talking about the dragon, Hagrid suddenly pales because he notices a kid peering through the window before running back to the castle. Harry looks out the window and recognizes Draco Malfoy. Now the trio also have to worry about Malfoy telling someone about the dragon. They try to convince Hagrid to set it free, but Hagrid says that he's too little and will die. He has named the dragon Norbert and is convinced that Norbert knows him now. Harry tries to point out how risky the whole situation is, with Norbert growing so fast and Malfoy knowing about him. He comes up with the idea to send the dragon to Ron's brother Charlie, since he is in Romania studying dragons. Ron thinks that it is brilliant, and they send an owl off to Charlie. Several days later, Harry and Hermione are hanging out in the common room around midnight, waiting for Ron to get back from helping Hagrid out with Norbert. Ron shows up and takes off Harry's invisibility cloak, complaining that Norbert bit him. At this time, Hedwig shows up with Charlie's response, and they have a plan worked out to use the invisibility cloak to get Norbert up to the tallest tower on Saturday night and send him off with some of Charlie's friends. Their plan is slightly impeded when Ron's hand turns green and swells to twice its normal size, and he has to go to the infirmary. While there, Malfoy shows up to mock him under the pretense of needing to borrow his book that also happens to have the letter from Charlie in it. Despite Malfoy now knowing about the plan and Ron being incapacitated in the hospital wing, Harry and Hermione decide that they still need to go ahead with the plan. They go to let Hagrid know about it, and he can't even let them in because of how difficult Norbert is being. He sadly approves of the plan, and the two of them can't wait for Saturday to be over. Saturday night, Harry and Hermione show up at Hagrid's to collect Norbert. Hagrid has him packed up in a crate with rats, brandy, and a teddy bear. After a very teary goodbye, the two of them and Norbert are under the invisibility cloak and manage to get all the way up to the tallest tower. Along the way, they see Professor McGonagall has caught Malfoy out of bed and is telling him off. He's trying to tell her about the dragon, but she doesn't believe any of it. This lifts their spirits as they wait for Charlie's friends, who show up a bit later. They get Norbert's crate all strapped into the harness and fly off taking Norbert safely away. Relieved, Harry and Hermione head back down the stairs and run right into Filch. They had left the invisibility cloak up in the tower. In the movie, it is nighttime and the trio is rushing to Hagrid's hut. They bang on his door and though Hagrid opens it, he initially does not want to let them in until they blurt out that they know about the Sorcerer's Stone. He says, oh, and lets them in. Harry tells Hagrid that Snape is trying to steal the stone, but Hagrid tells them that Snape is one of the teachers protecting the stone and isn't about to steal it. Harry picks up on his comment, one of the teachers, and Hermione points out that of course other teachers must have done spells and enchantments to protect it. Hagrid confirms that, but says it's a waste of time because no one will get past Fluffy anyway. He says that only he and Dumbledore knows how to, and then immediately regrets telling them that. A cauldron hanging over his fire starts to rattle, and Hagrid pulls a dragon's egg out of it and puts it on the table. Ron asks him where he got it, and he tells them that he won it from a stranger in the pub. The egg hatches, and Ron identifies it as a Norwegian Ridgeback, and says his brother Charlie works with them in Romania. Hagrid calls the dragon Norbert and pets him under the chin. 
The little dragon sort of hiccups and sets Hagrid's beard on fire. As he is patting out the fire, he notices a face at his window. To their horror, Malfoy has been watching and saw the whole thing. It cuts to the trio walking back to the castle from Hagrid's hut. They are talking about how crazy it is that Hagrid got a dragon and how bad it is that Malfoy knows when Professor McGonagall steps out and intercepts them. Looking smug, Malfoy steps out and gives the trio a knowing smirk. This is one of the biggest changes from book to movie that we've had yet. Yeah, before this we did have when they took out the Midnight Duel. Um, The changes there not only cut out half the chapter, it also left Neville out of the discovery of the three-headed dog entirely. Right. Though in this section, not only did they omit a good portion of the chapter, they also changed quite a few of the other details. True. True. The movie transitions right from the trio figuring out who Nicholas Flamel is and rushing right to Hagrid to tell him they know and then condenses everything from that chapter into that. Yeah. Yeah. It cuts out Harry and Ron trying to boost up Quirrell so he can keep standing up to Snape. Mm -hmm. The two of them getting annoyed with Hermione's, obsessing over the study schedules, and all of the homework the teachers are piling on. They end up spending a lot of time back in the library to get their work done. And it's in the library that they run into Hagrid lurking in the dragon section. Oh, yeah, that's not a, that's not a thing at all in the, in the movie. <laughs> but I do totally wish we could have seen Hagrid in the library because, like, he's gigantic. So he probably would have been, like, like coming towering. up to the dock of the yeah. shelves. I wonder if they decided to skip that because it would have been too hard to have that set and still have him look giant in it. Yeah, they maybe. They w- maybe would have had to build, like, a smaller version of the library <laughs> so he looked extra big because they did that with a lot of his oh, sets. Oh, yeah, they did that with a bunch of the sets. And so, they would have to, like, film them separately from the kids so that they could do forced perspective and stuff. So maybe that was more of a reason. Yeah, maybe. It would make sense. I mean. But while they're in the library, you know, Hagrid wants to know if they're still trying to figure out about Nicholas Flamel. And when they tell him they already know, he invites them to his hut later to talk more privately so they won't be overheard. Yeah, not like in the movie where they just burst in on him, pretty much. Then you get that cute shot of little itty bitty Hermione in Hagrid's giant ass chair. Right, and Ron and Fang becoming BFFs forever. Uh, Saying forever was a necessary best friends forever forever. Forever ever, forever ever. I'm just saying it's redundant and repetitive. Department of Redundancy Department, how can I help you? By getting us back on track for our episode. Right. Just keep rolling. The trio were talking to Hagrid about the Sorcerer's Stone in Hagrid's hut, where they are meeting with Hagrid to discuss the Sorcerer's Stone. Yes, thank you, Department of Redundancy Department. De nada. You're welcome. Goodbye and so long. Yeah, anywho. (laughs) I guess this scene is a little similar to the book because they are in Hagrid's hut talking about the Sorcerer's Stone and who is guarding it, though the book specifically mentions all of the teachers involved and the movie only mentions Snape's involvement. Yeah, though they do confirm that other teachers are involved, they just don't give names. Yeah, and it also leaves out the part where Hagrid tries to serve them stoat sandwiches. And I'm sorry, but that is so weird. What? Hagrid's an animal lover. Why is he cooking and eating stoats? They're adorable. I mean, I think cows are adorable, but I'm still going to eat the fuck out of hamburger. But how many people do you know that have cows as a Patronus? I feel like Justin will have something to say about this. His Patronus is a stoat. People have deer as Patronus. Patroni? Patroniuses? But venison is still a thing. I don't know. It still seems weird to me. I... I don't find it that strange, but why don't we make this a Potter pondering so we can see what everyone else thinks and then we can get back to the chapter at hand. Fine, we can move on, but I still say it's weird. Stoats are too cute to eat and they don't even really have enough meat on them. Enough to make a sandwich, apparently. Poor little stoties. (laughs) But let's just keep rolling. Oh, God. This scene is also when the trio first finds out about the dragon's egg. Yeah, but in the movie, they find out about the dragon's egg. It hatches, and Malfoy sees it all in one go. And in the book, it, that all happens over multiple days. Mm-hmm. They're talking about the other teachers helping to guard the stone, and Harry complains about it being too hot, and that's why they find out about the egg. Yeah. The movie has them finding out because it's actually, like, hatching. Like, it's actually happening, basically. Yeah, that's not how it happens in the book. They hang out and talk about how Hagrid won the egg in a game of cards. Yeah, in the movie, he said he won it off a stranger in the pub. So, I mean, that's pretty much the same. He doesn't say how or... Yeah. You know. Didn't he say something, too, about 
him being glad to be rid of it. Yeah, yeah, you, you seem quite glad to be rid of it, as a matter of fact. Probably because it's illegal to have dragon eggs. That may have something to do with it. Who knows? Who knows? But they also talk about how the book Hagrid got out of the library tells him how to take care of the egg by keeping it in the fire, and that after it hatches, he has to give it a bucket of brandy mixed with chicken's blood every half hour. Which was our trivia question answer this week, and damn, all that alcohol. No wonder dragons are lit. (laughs) No wonder. But that is a lot of brandy. A lot of brandy. A bucket every half hour? That's 48 buckets a day and, and what, like, three gallons of brandy each bucket? Where is he getting that much brandy? And that much chicken blood, for that matter. I wonder if the Hogwarts students noticed they were eating a lot more chicken all of a sudden. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Chicken again? Ron wouldn't mind. He's he's over there double fisting chicken legs. (laughs) But. (laughs) But we digress. Yeah. Dragon diets and chicken dinners aside. (laughs) In the book, Hagrid also uses the book to identify the type of dragon. Yeah, the movie had Ron identify it and say that his brother works with them in Romania. Right. But then instead of watching the egg hatch, the trio leaves Hagrid's horrified. 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 That he has a dragon's egg and it becomes one more thing on their plate of worries. Since having a dragon is illegal. Not that that stopped them from being totally excited to go see it hatch, though. <laughs> right? Hagrid sends them a note with Hedwig the morning it starts hatching, and Ron and Harry just want to skip class. Yeah. There is some clear concern about illegal activities there. They do start to show some actual concern when they realize there's a chance that Nazi Vaughn Douchebag the Second overhears them talking about the dragon hatching. That's how Malfoy even knows to show up at Hagrid's hut and peek in through the window. Yeah, the movie just has Malfoy there. My theory is that he watched Harry, Ron, and Hermione rush out of the library so quickly that he decided to follow them and spy for a bit. Which honestly makes a lot of sense, because he is kind of a nosy little bitch. Mm Mm-hmm. Fact. But in the book, the trio head to Hagrid's hut on their morning break, and we get to see the dragon hatch then. Yeah. I don't mind how the movie showed this section of the scene, though. In... in both Hagrid refers to himself as mummy, just like Newt. Yeah. Oh, bless him, he knows his mummy. He knows his mummy. <laughs> just like, yeah, just like Newt Scamander does in Fantastic Beasts. And we do get to see that the name, that he names the dragon Norbert. Yeah, despite being so condensed, it is still fun to watch. Yeah. Like, well, it's just the me knowing the book and everything that was left out that's just going like, what? No. Don't get me wrong, I missed that stuff, but like... Like, come on, that cute little sneeze, hiccup, fire burpy thing that Norbert does that sets Hagrid's beer on fire. It's just adorable. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was like a more hazardous version of my child's hiccups. I don't think I would want, I already don't want a child, but <laughs> I think I'd be a little bit more inclined to not want. Like, if you could increase that not want, it would increase if the child could burp fire. <laughs> I'm, I, yeah. Honestly, though, I'm really bummed that Hermione didn't get to say, but Hagrid, you live in a wooden house. (laughs) (laughs) But that wouldn't have made sense because Hagrid's house in the film is made out of stone. I mean, the roof could be made out of wood. Like, the frame is probably still wood. There are still flammable components, you know? Don't look at me like that. Fine, you're right. It would take away from the line, I guess. I'm right. Put one in the Allen column. Mark it. Yes. (laughs) But this is pretty much the last part of this section that maintains similarities. Yeah, parts were eliminated and therefore super condensed, but the gist of what happened stayed the same. Just almost in an outline form. The rest of this chapter is almost nothing like the movie. Nothing. (laughs) Yeah, partially because there's barely anything left to the movie scene. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a big part of it. <laughs> like, they transition the scene right into the trio being caught out of bed by Professor McGonagall. Like, end scene. That's, we're done. Yeah, and that still Deuces. annoys me. That still annoys me, because not only does it cut out the rest of chapter 14, it also completely changes how they actually got in trouble. 
Well, I mean, it does give us the same end result, even if how they got there is different, I guess. I mean, I know that it moved the story along in a manner that still got the important plot-defining scenes in. <laughs> but the rest of Chapter 14 has several days go by, with Malfoy taunting the trio, the dragon getting bigger and more violent, a plot to send Norbert to Charlie in Romania, and Ron getting bit and having to go to the hospital wing. Malfoy borrowing a book from Ron and ending up getting his hands on the letter from Charlie that lays out their plan for getting rid of Norbert. All of that was gone. <sighs> you're right there? Wow. Rantling a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I get what you're saying, though, because it cut a thing that I always thought was really funny. When Harry comes up with the idea to send Norbert to Charlie in Romania, he just turns to Ron and he says, Charlie. And Ron immediately thinks Harry is losing his mind and, like, has to remind him that, no, I'm Ron. Right. And, and <laughs> How many times has Ron been called by a sibling's name for his knee-jerk reaction to be to correct him? Well, I mean, to this day, I still refer to myself, to my mother as Kim Kate somebody because she called me Kim Kate somebody forever. Wait, and I don't have sisters. I had brothers and it was still Marty, John, Pixie, Gracie, like with the cats before oh God, she yeah. finally settled on Alan. I'm like... Oh, my dad's favorite story to tell is the fact that his mom would go through every, all his siblings' names, plus the dog's name, who was Billy, in case you're wondering, Billy Coffee, and then just end it with whoever the hell you are. Right. That was a thing, too. Yeah. And I feel like Molly would totally do something like that, especially with- What, that many kids? Seven kids. Yeah. She totally had trouble with their names. And with some of them being twins, too. Like, you know some of them, two of them being <laughs> twins. <laughs> It'd be weird if he said three of them. But, like, it literally was his knee-jerk reaction. No, I'm wrong. Like, yeah. maybe it's almost just, like, muscle memory at this point. Yeah, right. Charlie. No, I'm wrong. Yeah, especially since Harry's never even met Charlie, has he? Yeah, why would he be calling him Charlie? Like, he's never met him. Why, Ron, why would Harry call you by a brother that he doesn't even know of? (laughs) But, sadly... None of this was in the movie, Not even a little bit. Same with Harry and Hermione taking Norbert up to the tallest tower to meet with Charlie's friends and send Norbert on his merry fucking way. <laughs> During which they also see Professor McGonagall has caught Malfoy out of bed and he gets a detention and some points taken away. See, that was, I mean, that was sort of a thing since the movie scene implies that Malfoy went straight to Professor McGonagall to tell on them about the dragon. Though we do end up with a like a bit of an overlap in the details since we don't actually see Malfoy getting a detention until the next scene, which we'll, you know, talk about next week. Yep. And then the book chapter ends on Harry and Hermione being so relieved that they got rid of the damn dragon <laughs> that the dumbasses completely leave the invisibility cloak in the tower and get themselves caught by Filch. Well... That does seem their M.O., though, isn't it? Like, the second they get away with something, they do a dumbass thing and get caught. Yeah. (laughs) Something very brave, and then something very stupid. Yes, exactly. Although, I did notice somebody, (laughs) um, they were asking, why in the world did Hagrid let them take a dragon at midnight up to the tallest tower? Like, why couldn't Hagrid have done it? Right? Although... My theory on that, like, I actually, my theory, I say that like I thought of this ahead of time. This just popped into my head right now. But um, my thought is that Hagrid would have never followed through on it. He'd be like, no, I'm going to keep him. That's (laughs) that's actually a pretty good thought. I would have thought that, like, they maybe could have, like, met in a clearing of the Forbidden Forest or so. Like, I don't, I just don't feel like. I mean, for that matter. I mean, I like I understand the whole thing about the tallest tower because they just fly in. Yeah, they don't have to even land all the way down, and because who knows what kind of security system what, they have? What like booby traps? No, I mean they could. The perimeter could be surrounded with the caterwauling charm or something. Okay, yeah. And if okay. they fly down too low into it, maybe it would set that off and make a good ruckus. I guess I can kind of see that. So, it, like I like to me being up on the tallest tower makes sense, but sending the two. 11-year-olds yeah, with the dragon out of bed at midnight. So many bad things there. Like, what kind of... And this is why, like, I find find it kind of funny when people try to say that Hagrid was the father figure because... He let him do a lot of stupid shit. Yeah. (laughs) And he did a lot of stupid... He wasn't... Like, I think of him as the fun uncle. Yeah. Funkle. Yeah, he's the Funkle. Funkle Hagrid. Funkle Hagrid. (laughs) (laughs) 
It makes me wonder, though, because in the movie, he says, Hagrid says later on that, that Dumbledore sends him to live in a colony in Romania. Why couldn't they have just done that? Right. I and mean, we'll talk about that more when we get to that part. But yeah. Yeah. It, like, in, in, the, in the movie... Dumbledore just handles it. And yeah. Dumbledore lets Hagrid get away with everything. Like, <laughs> seriously. You can't honestly tell me that if Hagrid had been like, so I'm dumb. <laughs> you know how I am with animals. So, hey, this thing happened. I want it. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think it through. Now there's a dragon in my house. Yeah. What do I do? Yeah. And Dumbledore would be like, okay, here's okay. what we do. We could train it up and it could guard the castle. Like, Dumbledore would have ideas. I just don't, yeah, I don't, this is one of the very rare times I actually prefer a movie's change. And yeah, and and I didn't, I didn't hate that they did that, but it erased all of the problems that having the dragon caused for Harry and Hermione. Yeah. And that I missed. Yeah. I mean, it's, don't get me wrong. It would have, it was something I would have liked to have seen in the film. But at the same time, I also kind of feel like it took a little bit away from the main issue at hand, which is them trying to figure out the Sorcerer's Stone, them trying to... It was like a little side plot yeah. problem. Yeah, I mean, it, it furthered it, the it, yeah, plot, and, don't and get me wrong, but... It did, it did, but the movie figured out a way to further the plot. But it almost makes me wonder, like, why include it at all? Yeah. Well, because, you know, dragons are fun, and... Very obviously, their CGI build covered dragons, but not turning Harry's eyes green. I'm having this moment where I can't even think of words <laughs> to describe how much that annoys me. <laughs> I mean, dragons are fun, but in the movie, it literally added nothing to the plot. They could have had any reason for the trio to be out of bed after hours because they did that all the fucking time. Yeah. Like, they didn't, it didn't need to be the dragon. They cut so much of it out, it was pointless. Yeah, but we got adorable shots of Hagrid calling himself mummy. That's and true. Okay. having his beard lit okay. on fire. I And itty-bitty Hermione in Hagrid's biggest chair. I will, I will <laughs> rewind that. <laughs> it was not pointless because Hagrid calling himself mummy was yeah. definitely worth it. And, and I'm glad we got to mitts. see that. And the little sneezy thing. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Okay, it wasn't pointless. But still. But they still chopped so much of it that its worth to the story wasn't as big. Yeah. Enjoyable. Not as meaty. (laughs) Kind of like a stoat sandwich. Ah! Ah, see what I did there? You do see what you did there. I did. And I'm glad you did that because it's our Potter pondering and that's what we're moving on to. But I don't like that they're eating stoats, Justin. I know you're with me on this. Since I personally don't find it all that strange. But since Ellen had trouble moving past it, obviously, I do believe Ellen's got some issues. um, Our Potter pondering this week, as we said before, is... Is it weird that Hagrid was serving stoat sandwiches? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> I just think people eat weird shit all the time. But stoats, I don't... We'll see what you guys think. I'm really interested to know if anybody else is on Team Ellen for this one. I'm not... <laughs> here's the thing is, personally, if someone says, hey, here's a stoat sandwich, I'm gonna be like, thanks, I'll pass, I'm good, I just had a Big Mac. I'm set. <laughs> but if somebody else is going to eat a stoat sandwich in front of me, I'm not going to be, like, freaking out about how adorable stoats are. Stoats are friends, not food. <laughs> but we're just going to keep on rolling. Oh, we'll get your opinion on that. And we'll just move on to this week's Sorting Hat story. And it is from Jackie Hansen. She says, I've been a fan of the books for 20 years. Me too. (laughs) My dad bought me the books when I was about eight years old. I've loved the books and movies ever since, and I'm 28 now. I saw the first movie in theaters when I was 10, and I've also been loving Fantastic Beasts. My favorite character is Luna because she's not afraid to be herself. When I started reading, I could not put it down and read every chance I got. My house is Hufflepuff. Pottermore had put me in Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, and Ravenclaw, but I personally prefer Hufflepuff. 
My wand is laurel wood with a unicorn hair core, 10 inches. My Patronus is a Manx cat. Ooh, hey, me too. And we've had quite a lot of cats, but this is specifically the same cat as you. Specifically Manx cat, yep. I personally prefer the books because the movies change a lot of things and omit characters completely, like Charlie Weasley. Both me and my BFF have the same Harry Potter tattoo of the Deathly Hallows, except hers has stag antlers. Now, is that her BFF forever? BFF forever. (laughs) Both redundant and repetitive. I actually love that this lined up for her to talk about. I mean, we always talk about how much the movies change from the books, but to specifically mention Charlie Weasley when we just talked about him. Just missing out on Charlie. Yes. Like, person-wise, he wasn't omitted from the movies, but existence-wise. Yes. Like, they mentioned Mention him. Mention-wise, yes. He got mentioned. hmm But he did not actually, like, grace us with his presence. Through a letter or otherwise. Because no, he wasn't technically in the book either. Just through letters. Because he didn't show up. Well, no, up. not in the book, but in the series. Yeah. He was omitted well, from yeah. the oh, whole yeah, movie yeah. series. Like, oh, yeah, they yeah. never got to meet him. So I was, I yeah, was thinking I was we were saying. literally just talking about the chapter. I no, got you. I just meant in general. That this is yeah. the first mention of Charlie... As a, like, somebody that they were kind of interacting with. Yeah, I definitely missed Charlie. I wish we could have had some Charlie. Thank you so much for sharing your sorting hat story, Jackie. Yeah, it was good to hear from you. And she shared a picture of her tattoo as well. It looks really cute. Us Manx cats gotta stick together, you know. (laughs) But that'll bring us to this week's trivia question, which is, Who are the three centaurs we see in the Forbidden Forest? Comment under the post on our Facebook page with the answer and the code word <sighs> hashtag common mule. She did it. She did it. We actually, I, <clears throat> I did camel case it for her. Mm-hmm. So it says hashtag capital C common capital M mule, all one word. So it, it's still, it's sort of like the compromise. It's one word. That ain't a comp- uh, hmm. It's one word, but it's acknowledged to be two separate words hashtag together. By camel casing it. I did that for you because I love you. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. However. Anyway, code word. Hashtag common mule. The prize for the first one who responds with the correct answer and <clears throat> the hashtag code word will get a bitch is a witch, motherfucker's a wizard, just keep rolling, or a pride sticker. Those are our newest stickers. I just shared them up on Instagram and I think Facebook. And Mm -hmm. now that I have the actual tangible stickers that have arrived, I'll be retaking our picture of our sticker collection and I'll reshare that too. Yes, it's exciting. Yeah, I love them. They're so cute. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us. If you are an Apple person, you can do it through the Apple Podcast or iTunes app. If you don't have Apple, you can write a recommendation on our Facebook page. Then email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. And don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. If you would like to support us as a patron for extra perks, you can go to patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. And as always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. We actually just recorded our second Potterheads of History Yes. Episode with one of our patrons. So look for that. It just came out right before this episode. So if you didn't catch it yet, go back and try and find it. Mm -hmm. It's all about divination because our patron is Tabitha Dial and she is a cheese astrologer. She she is a tarot and tea leaf (laughs) reader and has a book coming out about cheese astrology. Because cheese. Because cheese. And it's pretty awesome. So we just, but we just recorded that right before recording this. So it's fresh <laughs> on our mind. Yes. And those, we do those Potterheads of History once a month for patrons. Right now, while we are building this family, we're making them available to everyone. But mm-hmm. in the hopefully. Those sneak peeks, if you will. Yes. In the hopefully near future, though, it will just be a patron perk. So we hope that you might look into joining our family and help support us for all of these awesome things that we want to make to bring to you guys Mm -hmm. it includes artwork and t-shirts and buttons and stickers and other ideas we have up our sleeves and a cooking show a cooking show is on the books Mm -hmm. so uh, aside from that you can join us next week 
when we talk about Chapter 15, The Forbidden Forest, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just just keep keep rolling. rolling. Thank you.